thank you for having me here to uh, come speak. Robin was kind enough to accept my talk. Uh, I'm here, I'm Chris Trunser. I'm talking about, the, the talk is entitled, A Battle Against the Industry, Feeding Antivirus for Meterpreter and More. Um, to give a little background on myself, I am a previous systems administrator, never started in security, just always thought it was kind of fun as I was learning it through uh, university. And uh, found out that, hey, I can actually do a job where I hack computers, like that sounds amazing. And so uh, I was lucky enough to be able to slowly work myself into that path, and here I am. I graduated from Florida State in uh, Florida in the US. Uh, I currently live in Colorado, so I get to see the beautiful mountains every single day. And uh, I'm an open source software, I use developer very loosely, where I try to write code. Um, some of the prod uh, projects that I work on is uh, Veil Framework, uh, Eyewitness, which I think Robin just left, but basically if you've ever used Eyewitness, pr pretty much every single feature that's in that has been driven completely by Robin. So thank you, Robin. Uh, Egress Assess, Just Metadata, and a couple other ones. So it's been a, a, a bunch of different projects that I've slowly learned and started trying to contribute back to the community. So to give an idea about what I'm talking about today, uh, I wanna hopefully share some laughs about uh, antivirus. Uh, kind of give a background on stagers, how they work when you get your meterpreter shell or beacon or anything else. Like wh what's actually happening that allows you to get that session. Uh, I'm gonna showcase a Veil Evasion uh, signature bypass where we were, uh, McAfee I believe it was, wrote a signature for some of the stuff that we were doing, and I'll show you how trivial it was to bypass that, essentially. Uh, I'm gonna talk about developing your own code real briefly, and then more of, I'm gonna give a, go over a couple different case studies where of three different pieces of custom code that we wrote that uh, is available for anyone to use, and uh, which is simply how we bypassed antivirus and allowed us to do whatever it was that we wanted to uh, when we were on our test. All right, oh gosh, I'm sorry these, graphics are coming up really oddly. But uh, I'm gonna go over real quickly, talk about stagers, <laughs> how they work, uh, what they do, and um, the whole point of them. <laughs> yeah. All right, so stagers can kind of, are more commonly referred to as stage one when it comes uh, to something that you're running on, on a, a, a computer. Uh, this might be your output from a tool like MSF Venom, which is packaged with uh, the Metasploit framework a tool like Veil Evasion develops stage ones, uh, and, and so forth. The goal for stage one uh, executables is to typically inject shellcode into memory. Um, this can be done because uh, the, the shellcode that is injected within the stager typically will download uh, a reflective DLL, which may be meterpreter, which may be beacon if you're using Cobalt Strike, or it could be any custom written uh, reflective DLL that you write. Uh, and that's stored somewhere. And so the goal of these stages is it'll go out, assuming you're doing a reverse connection, and download that DLL, inject it into memory, and get it running. And that, when, once that happens, that's when you see that neat little uh, session one open through an interpreter. You can also write it to do anything else that you want, uh, to be completely honest. Uh, you have to just write it yourself, but uh, that's kind of the main point of stages. Stagers are really kind of used for loaders for your real malware. Uh, they're not, there's no, almost no functionality in a stager itself other than to go out and download this file and get it running to memory. They're designed to be expendable and tiny, so you're not engineering your malware, spending a lot of time on that and putting that immediately on disk only to either have it get caught, signatured, or something like that. Uh, stagers are purely for they do nothing except load your real malware. Uh, and the nice thing about it is typically you can load everything all in memory. So again, like I was saying, uh, it, it'll prevent that on disk detection because pretty much if you can live in memory, uh, nothing that you write or are trying to use on a system will get caught. That's unless you're using a rootkit kind of like Kaspersky, which is really, really kind of <laughs> kind of good. Um, so kind of the functionality of stagers, or the cool thing about stagers is that any language that has access like the Windows API and Windows function call can be used to write a stager. So this kind of expands what the languages you can write a stager in. So normally, what, like your traditional Windows languages are C, C++, C Sharp. 
But as long as you can interact with that Windows API, you can do it with a lot of different languages. Uh, we're doing it with Python, with some Ruby. Uh, PowerShell is kind of obvious, but like Perl. These are what you would probably consider non-standard like Windows languages that you would write code in. A interacting with this API, it, ca it can be daunting. I know it holds a lot of people back sometimes from trying to dabble and like learn how to work with it, but it, you can write a stager making function call uh, that does all of this action with only maybe four or five function calls. It's pretty quick and it's relatively simple, I like to think. Hopefully I'm gonna try to explain it here. So I'm gonna go over real quickly the different function calls. This is like the main technical part. I'm gonna try to make this kind of quick because it's a little dry, but uh, I want everyone to have the background on how it works so you can have a little understanding as we go through the rest. Uh, of this talk. So stagers, the very first thing that they'll do is uh, when you are, are trying to inject shell code is it allocates memory within the current process you're running. And so this is like your MSF Venom output. This is your Veil Evasion output. The second you run and double click on that program, it has to allocate memory to store the shell code because you're obviously trying to inject shell code into memory. So it has to put that somewhere and allocate that. The next step, is it copies the shell code you're trying to load into memory actually into memory. So that is stored somewhere that, uh, that can be used by your process. The third part is it creates a thread which runs that shell code which has been stored into memory. And then the last part is uh, where your program says, hey, don't execute this process main. Let that thread finish uh, before you exit the program. And so that's like, let's say you get an interpreter session or a beacon session. Uh, the second you get that in, you want that thread to stay open because that's how you're interacting with that computer over an interpreter or beacon is the thread is still running. If your process were to close, you would like your thread would just die. You wouldn't have any interpreter or beacon session anymore. So you need basically some sort of like blocking call that says, hey, please don't uh, exit. Uh, just keep waiting right here. So... One thing that I've kind of talked about this before, and the, the function that people use usually for allocating memory is this function virtual alloc. And that's what's commonly used by a lot of different uh, programs out there today, which is, this is a function which allocates memory in Windows, uh, but there's an alternate way that you can also uh, store or allocate memory within a current process. And it's not necessarily any better, but it's just not as heavily utilized. So changing something like, uh, instead of using virtual alloc, we'll use something called heap create. Simply making that function change can help lower your detection rate because uh, sometimes when it comes to AV signatures, uh, the AV companies will write it based off of which specific function calls are you calling, like how quick are they, what order is it coming in. And so if you're calling something that's unexpected by them, that's not this virtual alloc function, then you, uh, you're changing it up and you, you may be bypassing their signature. So the five function calls here, heap create is one of them. What this does is this basically just creates a heap object for your the current process that you're running. So that stager, that executable that you uh, that you just created and that is running is now having a heap uh, object created for it. And you have to tell it like how much size. So it's like it needs to know what amount of shell code do I need to store inside of it. And so th this is where it creates that and allocates a certain amount of space. I usually do about twice the shell code length, but uh, anyone can, I mean, do whatever you'd like. Heap alloc is kind of virtual alloc's cousin, where uh, this is, okay, of that heap that was allocated or created, let's allocate a certain amount of memory uh, from that to store our shell code. RTL move memory is that function, so that's that first step where I talked about we're creating and allocating memory within a current process. RTL move memory is the function that uh, copies shell code from the program and injects that into memory itself. Create thread, this is uh, the next step where after you've copied that shell code into memory, you basically feed it a handle, which is the uh, where in memory your shell code starts, and it'll create a thread and start running that. And so this is, uh, assuming you're doing like a MSF Venom stager or a Veil Evasion stager, this is where it'll start connecting, the thread will run to start connecting back to your interpreter handler and download interpreter and run it in memory. And wait for single object is this function that, again, it's kind of like a blocking call. It says, hey, don't let this whole process just exit, because uh, if you did, you'd lose your stage or your stager and interpreter session. 
uh, be a blocking call. Simply wait, let thre uh, the thread complete. So if you're using Interpreter, uh, it obviously wants to stay running. And so this will keep it, the program from completely dying. So I know it's kind of dry. Uh, it's, it's not a lot of fun, but that's basically stagers in this nutshell where it's this process, kind of like I just said, of allocating memory, copying your shellcode that you want to inject into memory, creating a thread that runs the shellcode, and then waiting for it to go. All right, so visual real quick. Uh, I hope that's easy to see. Um, this is obviously a lot of shellcode here that we're trying to uh, inject into memory. This is P Python, by the way. Uh, and so here are like our function calls. So here's heap create, what I was just talking about, heap alloc. And so these functions are allocating memory uh, within this process once this is converted into an executable. RTL move memory is the function that is copying this shell code into the memory that's been allocated by this. Create thread is what's then creating the thread to inject and run the shell code, or run the shell code, excuse me. And then wait for single object is what's saying, hey, wait and let this uh, shellcode execute, wait till the thread is done before you exit the program. And so this right here is a stager in its entirety. So we're talking, what, maybe eight, seven, eight lines? It's really fast and easy to do. And some of it's just Python overhead, like this. C types is a library that allows Python to interact with the Windows API. And so just in eight lines of code, you can completely write your own stager, and it, it's, it's fairly quick. It's a tiny program. It doesn't take uh, a lot of programming background. So that, that was the kind of nice thing that got me interested when I first started uh, doing this. Veil Evasion was probably one of my first programs because uh, I've, I'd really never written anything beforehand. And so I was lucky enough to work with uh, some really smart guys, Will Schroeder and uh, Mike Wright, to help develop this tool. All right. So I was talking about heap alloc using these function calls to uh, kind, of, kind of change it up from the main standard that is virtual alloc to uh, inject shellcode into memory and run it. Well, that's, it works well. Changing the function calls can work really well. But sometimes it still gets caught. An old school kind of red teaming trick is this concept of using ordinal values to reference function calls uh, that will bypass antivirus. And so the way I kind of picture this in my head is like picture an array or a Python list containing uh, function calls each within each spot in the array. In order to reference a specific function, you have to reference like its location in that array. You're not calling it by name, you're calling it by where it's located in that array. Uh, it's the same concept for ordinal values. Windows uh, has obviously functions in them and you can access them by name, which is like what we were just doing here with heap alloc, virtual alloc, everything, uh, or heap alloc, heap create, we're calling this function by the name. Instead of doing that, we can just reference it by its ordinal value, which is its location uh, and where it's stored within the Windows, uh, a couple DLLs. And so, yeah, the, the same, it's the same exact function that is gonna be called when you do it by ordinal value, except you're doing it by its value rather by name. So. I'll give a quick example on checking out some code. So here's uh, that other way of writing a stager where they do virtual alloc, the same other function, so RTL move memory, create thread, wait for single object. So this is where we're referencing each function call within the stager by name. However, you can do something like this, where now this is actually, its ordinal value of virtual alloc is 1264. This one is 1049. 184, and 1280. This is the same exact function calls that we were making in this slide. However, I just looked up its ordinal value and am calling that function by its value rather than by name. And the really weird thing is when you do something like that and reference it by its value instead of by its name, you can completely bypass AV. It's this weird trick that like, they just don't know how to properly inspect ordinal values and use them when writing uh, detection methods. So the one thing to note when you're doing this is uh, ordinal values can change when, it comes, when we're talking from operating system to operating system and sometimes service pack to service pack. 
So when you're writing these, you kind of have to be uh, fairly targeted in the, uh, in, against the operating system that you're targeting it against. Uh, so if you're writing a payload for uh, Windows 7 Service Pack 1, that's not necessarily going to work on Windows XP, and it probably won't, because the ordinal values for these functions can change between operating systems. So the question is kind of how would you find these ordinal values? There's a free tool. It's called PEView, I think. Yeah, PEView or Viewer. Um, and so basically, I loaded up uh, the uh, DLL into memory. And so I'm looking at the export ads table. And so right here are all the different functions that are, be export, that are being exported. Uh, and so this one I, I've highlighted is specifically virtual hour. And so what this shows right here, this column says value. And this is base 16, so you have to convert it to base 10. But uh, th that's the value of virtual hour. So what, 0F, or 0, 4F0. So this is that in base 10. And th that's all it was. It's just looking up the value where your function is, finding that ordinal value, and simply replacing that in your code. And you're able to use that to completely bypass a lot of different AV, simply because they aren't looking at ordinal values. Uh, it, it's really easy thing to do. It just takes looking this up, or using this tool on the operating system that you're using, it, that you're targeting. Uh, but again, the main thing is you have to be targeted. It's not, you can't just make one and have it universally work on any single Windows system. PE view is, is that, okay, so yeah, that's the free program that I was just using. This lets you inspect PE files, DLLs, uh, basically whatever you want to load into it that, it that has the ability to inspect. Uh, I was just loading the kernel 32 DLL, and that's what I was using to uh, kind of look through and get that, that pretty picture, that you, this picture that you just saw, to uh, basically look at the, the deal, or the ordinal value. And again, the only note is that it provides a base 16, so you just have to convert it to, excuse me, base 10, uh, before you put that in whatever program you're running. All right, so I'm going to talk real quick about, so that's a kind of background on uh, stagers how they work. Ordinal values actually aren't in Veil yet. Uh, that's something that I'm looking, I'm going to be putting in pretty shortly. But it's going to require a little bit of customization because we have to keep like a basically a running database of all the ordinal values for each specific function call and then which service pack and operating system that they're uh, relative to. So it, it's going to take a little bit for me to put in, but uh, that's something I'm going to do. But we don't see a lot of programs out there doing this other than like custom written ones. So if you're looking for a quick win to try to bypass AV for a stager, try the ordinal values. So Veil Evasion, uh, one of the cool things is that how our approach with trying to build trust in the tool and uh, to allow it to continue to bypass AV is that it's completely open source. This was really important for us because when we run code on uh, a customer's computers, we need to, we're obviously held accountable to what's being run in that program. I don't have faith if there's a backdoor or something like that that's closed source. Uh, I don't like to run that on any of my customers' systems because I can't validate everything that's in that code. I don't know what it is. So if something malicious or bad were to happen, that's kind of a problem in my mind. So we, we wanted to keep this completely open source so that anyone can kind of look at it and gain trust in uh, the program and what we're actually using in the tool. And that's also why when we when Veil generates a payload, uh, it puts spits out like the executable, but then it also spits out the source code to that executable. So you can look at it and validate it. The next thing is that this can query virus totals API. So the first step everyone's probably like, well why would you ever want to query virus totals API? Uh, why would you want to do anything when you're writing a backdoor uh, to just have it get caught? Well that's not the point of this. The way that we query vi virus total, so everyone knows virus total for you upload an executable or some sort of file, and it'll scan it with a ton of different systems, or AV systems out there, and then it'll tell you, yeah, this is malicious, this is caught by these certain AVs, and so forth. That's not what this does. Every time that we generate a payload, a veil keeps a copy of its uh, SHA, I think a SHA-1 hash that we, we use to upload. Um, we then take that SHA-1 hash when the user says, hey, query virus total, and we'll upload the hash. So this is completely different from uploading the executable itself. There's no analysis of the payload. 
So there's no way for virus total to make a signature from that. What this is designed to do is let's say you're on a longer team off, you're on a red team, or maybe on a quick pen test, uh, and you think that the defenders there may have caught your payload. Uh, or maybe you want to check and see if anyone anywhere has somehow found that payload that you're using. This will query uh, for that specific file's SHA-1 hash. It'll send that to virus total. And then it'll let you know, hey, yeah, we found this here. This was submitted by someone. And so this is more an attacker's uh, kind of function where it lets you know if, hey, your files that you're dropping somewhere are getting investigated. So this, again, isn't uploading your payload. It's keeping that safe. It's letting you know as the uh, user or the offensive operator, yeah, something that you're just using that you just created is being investigated by a defender and kind of gives you a heads up. Okay, maybe I need to change stuff up. Maybe I need to use different payload files, uh, something like that. We attempt to bypass AV through a bunch of different techniques. Um, we'll have obfuscated code. So we'll, uh, let's say we'll just base64 uh, all the code that's inside of it. And so at runtime, it base64 decodes it, and, uh, and then it's good. Uh, so this is, it, that's simple like obfuscation to bypass like a real quick string analysis on it. Uh, we'll have encrypted code where we store the key inside of it. Uh, at runtime, it's, let's say it's AES encrypted, when you run that stager, because the key's in it, it'll completely decrypt all of the code inside of it, uh, and then it will inject the shell code into memory and then run it, and you'll get your, excuse me, you'll get your state. The other function that we just, I just added in, I think last month is, has everyone heard of the tool Hyperion? Cool. Okay. Hyperion is this awesome, uh, really cool tool that is was originally used a lot for AV bypass, uh, where the way it works is you feed it an executable. Hyperion then encrypts that executable with a stub and uses an artificially constrained key. And uh, once that, the output is this encrypted file that has no key. It's encrypted, but there's no key associated with it. And so the way that it works is when you run that file, it brute forces itself and it tries to find its own key. And once it finds its key, and it's able to do that because it's artificially constrained, so it may only have to like brute force a very small chunk of the key. And once it finds it, then it decrypts everything and then runs the original executable. So I just implemented that in Python for stagers, for Veil, where it does the same exact thing. Uh, the whole tool and all the function calls are encrypted and it uses an artificially key space. And so at runtime, you'll see like a spike in CPU usage real quick because it's trying to brute force itself and find like what the actual key is. Once it finds it, it decrypts everything and then uh, ingests the shell code in the memory. So one of the big things that really helped us, again, is kind of like I was talking about, the use of non-standard languages, is that's exactly what we did. Uh, we added support for a lot of different functions, or languages, such as Python, Perl, PowerShell, C Sharp, C, Ruby, and Go. And uh, simply, we kind of noticed that simply using these non-standard languages resulted in payloads that immediately bypassed antivirus. And the reason for that we're thinking is because AV just simply doesn't understand how to inspect languages that like maybe use interpreters such as Python and Perl. Um, or it just, it hasn't really seen them, so it doesn't know how to properly unpack them and look at the, the true nature of the code underneath it. And so a quick example is uh, kind of C flat versus Python flat. And so to give a kind of description, these are like veil terms. When I say flat, it means that there's no encryption, no obfuscation whatsoever in it. It's just literally function call after function call. Uh, it's not encrypted in any way. So oh, we may need the lights to go down a little bit here. I apologize for this dark screen. Um, this is the shell code here. Uh, this is a normal kind of C function or C, your, your source code for a C file. Uh, and so right here is the shell code that we want to inject. And here's those function calls I was talking about earlier. Virtual alloc, RTL move memory, create thread, wait for single object. So this, you could compile right now with any C compiler and uh, generate an executable that is going to inject this shell code into memory, run it, and you'll get, it'll whatever it does, it'll do. Next. This is Python code. And so this is a little bit of obfuscated code where you can see like some variables are just completely randomized. By the way, this is the biggest pain in the world to debug. 
every time I have, I'm writing a new payload in some language, I, I'm all, we're always trying to add some level of obfuscation so that it just, it's hard to read and interpret. And every time I make the tiniest of mistake in the, like, the original file, I get, like, junk output like this. But I have to spend, like, three times as long trying to figure out, all right, which was each variable. Like, it's, it's a massive pain. All right, but the main point here, what I want to show is, like, this is a Python uh, version of that same exact function as the C one, where we're calling virtual alloc, RTL move memory, create thread, and wait for single object. So it's the same exact thing. This is C. This is Python. What we observe is that C payload, th that C source code, immediately caught by antivirus right away. However, simply changing the language that it was written into Python completely bypassed every single AV signature. So the first thing that we did when we released Veil, the main thing was like Python-based payloads. And no AV saw that. So these are the same exact function calls where uh, we use that and all of a sudden everything said it was clean. There was not a single AV detection for any single one of them. All right, so we'll talk real quick about this. Uh, AV signature that we had developed for us in, uh, in Veil. Probably about, at, right about the one year mark after our first, uh, th that Veil was released, uh, someone told us on IRC, like, hey, I think you guys got a, a AV signature created. And I'm like, no, that, that didn't happen yet. I mean, it's, it's been a year. I kind of would have thought it would have been earlier, but we didn't think it happened. And uh, so he's like, hey, yeah, check out this link. And so sure enough, McAfee sent, or McAfee, how you pronounce it, since, uh, has this page up uh, that they were detecting Veil. It was this Trojan, and uh, they were able to catch it as it runs. And uh, I tested it out, and it was legit. Uh, right when we had it, this, the payloads that we had at that time, Python only, were being caught. So we're like, okay, I need to take a look at this. Uh, we may need the lights to go down again real quick. So this is what the payloads were, looked like at the time. Again, where it's this, C, we use C types, which is the library to um, inject, uh, interact with the Windows API. Here's our function calls uh, and so forth. But th this is what it looks like. So if anyone had to make a wild guess, like anyone have any idea what they may change here? Did they see any crazy constant or anything like that? All right, so I'll show the first thing that I saw, and I like I like to kind of do the project, like keep it simple, stupid. Like let's start with the easy stuff. Let's see if there's something simple and tiny that I can change real quick that would somehow change how it's being detected. Oh God, it's, it's not showing up really well. So what I have here, this is what I saw is C types. Is there's this, this is that library that is being used to work with the Windows API. And C types is everywhere. I have C types right here, C types here, 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 here. All these little black arrows, which are supposed to be red, <laughs> that's, that's where C types is in this file. So it's all over the place. And I was like, well, we have this string that's included in this program all over. They could be doing some simple detection, like, on, on the string, maybe the same amount of times that it's there. Uh, if it's there that many, so many times, uh, assume it's a veil payload and, uh, by, or signature. So, this is kind of what a Veil payload, like the Python code in the framework, looks like. And so this is, again, that virtual alloc right there, move memory, blah, blah, blah. So this is what it looks like when we're developing a module for it. This is our code. And so right up here, this is specific to that one. So hey, if you're using virtual alloc, which is what we were, and a Python payload to inject shell code, uh, this is what we saw. So I was like, all right, let's change the C types up. Has anyone developed in Python or done any Python development before? Cool, so you, you guys might like this. Let's change something real quick. So what you're seeing here is basically the diff in my code. Is uh, I'm just changing, this is what, it, the red is what it was, was supposed to be red, and the green is what I changed it to. And so Python has this awesome thing called aliases, where uh, you can, instead of importing C types and have to use the library name C types throughout the entire code, I can import C types as in this case, AVLOL. Uh, I can change it to whatever I want it to be and uh, reference that throughout the code. And so this is now, after that change, what it looked like. So here's AVLOL. 
A, B, L, O, L, L, O, L, 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 so forth. Uh, it's all over the place now. Like, let's just see one thing, like, what happens. And what do you know? Simply making that tiniest of changes completely bypassed McAfee's, uh, or McAfee's signature. This probably took about 30 minutes, maybe, to figure out, because I was expecting to, like, have to do a lot of work. And uh, it, it, it obviously was not all that bad to do. So uh, the point kind of here being is static signatures really aren't the greatest way to go about catching uh, different malicious files. Behavioral analysis, uh, heuristics and ana heuristical analysis, uh, I think is a lot better because then you're actually looking at the behavior of the program itself. When you do something like static signatures, uh, something like this will completely bypass it because you're just changing what uh, what was being used to catch it. And by the way, that's all that Veil is actually designed to really combat and like fight against is the signature-based payload. Uh, we don't claim to do behavioral-based stuff. Now, there's a lot of different ways that we can change up the order of these function calls, um, what we're doing, and or simply use different ones. But uh, we haven't needed to yet, unfortunately. All right, so I kind of want to end or go through a little bit of uh, talking about some custom code. And so this is going to be custom code is the main way to bypass antivirus. Like it's anything that like veil evasion still like people are trying to signature in some place. Certain payloads are like I said, like C, C plus plus, C sharp. Uh, they they're very hard to. It's a little bit harder to bypass with those because they're it's such it's so easy to inspect them and. Uh, the, AV companies have done a fairly decent job signaturing them, but uh, other languages make it a lot easier to just bypass. Uh, so the answer is writing your own program. Uh, if you can do that, there's no signature for it because you literally just created it. And so having custom code will kind of allow you to bypass whatever AV that you're targeting against. So this is a scenario that uh, we encounter. So I do a lot of red teaming, and a lot of the time we have to fish our way into an environment. And uh, basically, our, our kickoff call will be like, hello, uh, I'm the, I'm, from our customer's end, they're going to be like, uh, I'm your point of contact, so I'm here to validate that you are authorized to perform this test. Uh, we don't want to give you any information. We don't want to basically tell you anything. Just go. And so at that point, we basically have to stand up like our external C2 infrastructure somewhere in the cloud. Uh, and we'll try to have to get our initial access. And probably nine times out of 10, probably more so than that. Uh, in order to get that initial access, we'll fish our way into the environment. And so there's a couple different ways that we can do it. This isn't always our first one, but this is one that's worked pretty successfully, is where we have the scenario like a, a browser checking scenario. And so we'll, in this case, commonly try to spoof maybe the IT department or the IT security department of whatever company that we're going against. And, uh, and the way we'll kind of word the email is like we'll talk to them about hey there's a lot of like attackers that are out there right now that are using uh, targeting browsers and the misconfigurations and old versions of it to try to hack your system. Uh, we need you guys to make sure that you're running like have the most secure configuration as per our company guidelines and uh, that you have the latest up to date version. And so we'll send an email out basically pretending to be this company or their security team and say, we've got this all in one tool that'll do it for you. And uh, so we have this idea of basically making this browsing browser checker program. And uh, it's written by a coworker of mine, Hunter Hardman. And uh, it, it works great where uh, it completely bypasses AV uh, because no one's ever seen it before. And so this is actually uh, the first time he released it, I think, like a week ago. Uh, specifically for this talk. So it's it's easy to use and it's cool to check out where this is kind of a picture of it. And so it's written in C sharp. And what we'll normally do is let's say let's say we're targeting SteelCon. We would put SteelCon's logo right here uh, and just like include that right there. So it's right in the uh, in the program that loads up. And it's trying to build trust in the user that's actually running this. And so what'll happen is this will be just a blank black bar, and this will say start browser check, or run browser check in this case. And right when they run this, you'll, people will see the bar going across, so they're really happy that it's starting to secure their system. And at the end, it'll say it's passed. And what's happening in the background is, uh, also, yeah, this is what I was kind of talking about. What's happening in the background is that uh, 
is running PowerShell. And so it's creating a new process that uh, is running PowerShell and running whatever code that you tell it to. And so in this case, we typically use that to, uh, we use Cobalt Strike a lot. Uh, I'm a big fan of that. And uh, we're using that to get a beacon on our users or victim systems. And so they'll see, again, they see this bar go all the way across. They think their system is fine, that's passed, and uh, that you don't think anything else about it. And in the meantime, we, uh, we've got a beacon on their system, and that's our initial foothold and how we're moving around. Uh, rough stats on using these sort of things is probably a good amount is maybe 30%, um, maybe more. Uh, but the problem with this is it's an executable, so people are a little bit more wary about running an executable uh, from within an email or downloading it from somewhere. The main thing to note is that the delivery of this is kind of dependent upon the situation. We've done a di couple different ways to try and entice users to run this and download the file. Well, we'll create a fake website uh, host, uh, that's on over HTTPS, and the user will go to it. They'll see the HTTPS, they'll think it's secure, and uh, they'll download it from that way. Uh, we've created fake secure file transfer websites, which is the same concept. Um, but rarely we'll send just executable. Unfortunately, we've done that before, and uh, it'll still work, and people will still download it. Uh, so this program is actually available right here on his GitHub page. So if anyone wants to use it, it's a cool, nifty idea for custom code that you can take and you can modify it further uh, to whatever it is that fits your needs, and it'll let you. It works really well, so um, I, I highly recommend it because we've had pretty good success with it. All right. So the next tool is uh, is this weird name called Enumerator. Um, where we're on this assessment, and this customer didn't want us to run any sort of shellcode injection uh, tools on it. They didn't want us to get an actual beacon or any interpreter session. So we were instinctively like, oh. like we, we really wanted to be able to hack this, this any of their systems. Uh, but what made it kind of fun was they said, well, we don't want you to do that, but we want to collect stats from it. We want to, like, everyone wants stats. Uh, we want to see what sort of intelligence you can gather from systems rather than just simply hacking them, because we already know people are going to get fished. We just want to see what kind of info we can, uh, you can gather. So when we, did this, when we, when we had this problem, is I, I started creating a quick Python script that kind of gathers a lot of different information. And so what it was supposed to do is once it was downloaded and ran, uh, it would gather all the system information, and then it would post that data back out through a system proxy or a network proxy, if there's one there, and uh, it would send it back to a server that we control. So some of the information that they were wanted and that we kind of got added into this was stuff like the system host name, the IP addresses, if there's any, on, or multiple on the system, uh, system drives, uh, the amount of drive space on it, the current user that's running as, and the task list. We figured this would be a fairly decent amount of information that uh, the customer could use, uh, just to give kind of like a picture of these are the type of people that are paying, or, running your payloads that may be susceptible to phishing, and this is the amount of like access or information that an attacker could have uh, just right off the bat. And so this looks like, this, this is just a Python script in this case, uh, but you can easily convert this to uh, a, a standalone executable, and uh, it just looks like any normal Windows program uh, when running it. From the server side, this is basically it. It's a, a specialized, it's a modified uh, Python version of like the base HTTP handler, I think it is, uh, module, where basically this is only listening for post requests to this specific URI. If something like that comes in to this URI and is a post, it's not a get, it's not anything else, it'll then save the file um, and you'll get the data. And so this is the kind of stuff that is gathered, where we have up here, this is the system host name, in this case it's just my VM that I was testing it on in this case. Uh, we have the IP address, we have uh, the drives that are available on the system, we have my current username, uh, the processes that are currently running, and there's uh, some additional data there um, elsewhere. And I'm going to post the links to this shortly, but this is also, I'm realizing it's not in my slides, but this is available online and free to use in case anyone has scenarios where they need to do something like this. Uh, but the cool thing about it is obviously it's bypassing AV. Like there's no signature for something like this. Even though it's not 100% malicious where you're getting a complete system compromise. It's more of like that intelligence gathering, maybe it's the initial phase of something. 
and uh, anyone can use this and repurpose it. All right, so the last thing I kind of want to talk about is something we haven't talked about yet really is some, it's called WMIOPS or WMIOPS. Um, it, it's the, the kind of the purpose of developing this when I first started was there's not a lot of time, there's not a lot of reason to develop a lot of, or spend a lot of engineering time in developing a rat and building some sort of uh, piece, some piece of malware when we can, when it may get burnt. Like it's unfortunate, but it happens. So why not just leverage some built-in functionality? And really the perspective that we take and pretty much any red team or pen tester will take is any sort of administration like service or capability that can be used by administrators to admin a system or a server or whatever can be repurposed by hackers. So let's just live off the land Let's use built-in functionality to Windows and try to write something that uh, we can use to compromise systems. So how many here use WMI much? I know the Posh C2 guys have that in their tool. It's uh, awesome, cool. Uh, is anyone else really use WMI for uh, awesome, cool? So WMI is this service that's really useful. It's been uh, installed and running by default since Windows Server 2000. I believe you can actually get WMI on systems previous to that. You just have to download it and install it. But from 2000 and on, it's installed and running by default. Typically, unless you're installing like a malicious WMI class and provider, um, it will require local admin privileges to interact with. Uh, now, this there's a couple different ways you can do it, but th this is tool is primarily designed more towards like the post exploitation side like once you maybe have a uh, local admin on every system or uh, a workstation admin or a server admin account uh, it's used uh, kind of in this post exploitation phase so WimiOps is a powershell based script or tool that's designed to use wmi to carry out actions throughout uh, a network and so you can do a lot of different things with it. Uh, the nice thing is that it's all written in PowerShell, like Posh C2. Um, it has some of the similar functionality where you can execute commands. Uh, you can use it to run whatever you want on a remote system as long as you have local admin rights, all using WMI without ever having to like compromise that system. Um, you can also use it to do a bunch of other things. Like, let's say you want to start gathering information about a system, you can use it to uh, find IP. Uh, the IP address of any active NIC card on the system. You can use it to uh, do directory listings of a specific directory. You can do a ton of different things all over WMI. And this functionality is like already built into Windows and you can do it all remote. So if you compromise one system, end up getting local admin uh, within the domain, you can use WMI to almost do anything you would want for the rest of your tests. And it's, WMI is not, it's being used a lot more by attackers now, but it's not as heavily inspected by defenders. Like it, it's harder to see, um, and it uses, it's not just a standard process creation. It's, you can do a lot of different things with it. So let's say, uh, let's give you an example here is, let's say if I wanna have, which users have active process, processes on a system. And so this might be good information to have because I want to maybe gather credentials from any, a specific user that has stuff running on that system. And so rather than having to compromise that machine, do a task listing or PS or anything to see all right, who has something running, why not just use a WMI query and uh, gather information? So this is a little tiny and harder to see, but basically what this is doing is saying, hey, get process owners with WMI, target this specific system, and authenticate with this username and this password that's right here. And it's showing, hey, these different uh, accounts have active processes. We have Bruce Wayne, of course, and we have uh, NT authority systems that are also running. So we know at least the Bruce Wayne account is something that we may be interested in, that maybe we want to gather uh, their credentials and information. So now that we know who has active processes running on the system, let's gather those credentials. Uh, so there is another tool out there that's similar is Mass Mimicast, which kind of does, I think it's also written by Will Schroeder, um, that does, uh, kind of runs Mimicast on remote systems. And so, however, the traditional way of like gathering this information is by compromising it 
using something like Meterpreter, uh, loading Mimikatz up, uh, and, or Beacon, and running WDigest to get the, your credential information out. Why not leverage this WMI to do all of that for you without having to compromise that remote system? So we made this script, or this function, basically called remote script with output. The, the hard thing with WMI, especially when you're doing process creation, is you don't necessarily get output from it. Like you can see, hey, my process started, I didn't get like a weird exit code, so I know it's running, but that's it. So like if I run a PowerShell script, I may not get output from that PowerShell script. Or you won't if you're using WMI. So I wanted to figure out how we could actually change that and start getting output. And uh, we came up with this is kind of our, our answer at the moment, where what this does is this spawns PowerShell on the remote system that you're running it against. And it'll download the Power script or PowerShell script you want to run all in memory. It'll then run whatever function that you specify. So let's say if you're trying to run Mimikatz, you say, hey, run invoke Mimikatz. And um, it'll uh, do that on that system. Uh, it'll then save that output into a variable and then post it over HTTPS to a server that you control. And so now you're actually able to get output from using, after using WMI to start a process and uh, get information back. So this is what it normally looks like when you run a w, start a process with WMI. Like if you have kind of debug information, you're like, you're getting back, hey, this is your process ID, this is your return value, which is zero, which is good, which means your process started, but that's it. Like if I ran invoke Mimikatz on a system remotely, this is all I would see, so I'm not getting the actual output back. Unless you're using a, a tool that has some sort of functionality that will, that'll return that to you. Um, so now, this is what we're doing with invoke remote script with output. We're saying, hey, authenticate as this user, Bruce Wayne. Um, this is the password that they're there. So this is like the local admin. Uh, run it against this system. This is like the URL of the file that I want, or the PowerShell script I want you to load in memory. This is the function specifically I want you to run. And this is where I want you to post all the information back. So it's kind of a lot of information I have to ask for. But it'll get everything back. And so this is your output. It'll act, so you have your web server listening uh, at the location that you told it to. And it'll, once it gets that information, the script runs, it posts back the output and you get your full uh, Mimikatz dump inf of information there. So you can do, WimiOps is kind of interesting, I think, because we use it a lot for stuff like that where if we just want to get information from a remote system without having to completely compromise it. And it's all using built-in Windows functionality. It's not at all, we're not dropping anything to disk. It's all in memory, uh, which makes life a little bit easier for us. So this can do a couple different things. Like I said, you can run commands, uh, kind of like what we were doing there. Uh, you can kill processes. You can search for files on a system. Let's say you want to search for uh, any file that has passwords in its name. You can use WMI to search a remote system for files with passwords. It'll tell you exactly where they're stored, and then, you can use the transfer file functionality to actually download those files and uh, get a copy of them. And so this tool is, is available here. Uh, anyone can use it. It's been out for a little while, but we haven't really talked about it yet. Uh, so it's, it's kind of nice to get out, and hopefully other people will find uh, some decent use for it. So the main things with these three pieces of code is they were, are different tools. They're all custom functions. They bypass the AV because there was no signature for it. It was stuff that we just wrote because we seen we saw a need for it, and it, it started to make our life easier because no, nothing's catching it, especially this last one because uh, it's not being caught. The tool itself can be completely loaded in memory without ever having to drop the disk, and then uh, everything it does is all in memory. So we're not having to do anything that can leave forensic artifacts or room for detection by defenders or different solutions out there. So that's basically it. Um, I kind of wanted to go over real quick, again, this is how stagers work, how Veil does AV evasion, uh, how we bypass stuff, and then kind of the easy way of bypassing AV was to just create custom code that did whatever we needed it to do. Um, I think that's about it. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take. Otherwise, thank you very much uh, for coming to my talk. Thanks.